Hi everyone, Nicola here. In today's video, we will explore the world of Blackjack. Blackjack is one of the most popular gambling games. Casinos usually have a small advantage in this game and win about half a percent in expectancy against players. What sparked my curiosity is the idea that you can count cards and potentially win against casinos. So I decided to write some simulations and see for myself what's realistically possible. I haven't done a full comprehensive analysis on this topic, just explored it a bit. Nevertheless, the results are very surprising. I'm first going to explain the rules of Blackjack briefly, then I will walk you through the implementation for the Blackjack engine, which we will use to run the analysis. After that, I will explain and implement the basic strategy which gives the players the best chance, assuming no counting. And finally, I will explain one of the card counting strategies and implement it. How much do you think you can win if you count cards? And is it worth it? Let's find out in this episode of Coding Quests. The game is played with a couple of decks of cards, usually two or six. A player must place a bet to play the game, for example $25. Each player and the dealer receive two cards. Players show all of their cards, but the dealer only shows one card, keeping the other one face down. They compete against the dealer, not each other. A player aims to beat the dealer's score without going over 21. Going over 21 means the player loses instantly. The hand's score is the total value of its cards. Aces can be worth 1 or 11. Face cards, which is king, queen, or jack, are worth 10, while other cards match their rank's value. When the game starts, players have options to hit, which means get another card, or stand to stop playing. For example, if a player has a king and a 2, they can hit to draw another card. They get 7, and the total score is 19. At this point, they might choose to stand to avoid going over 21 and losing instantly. Each player follows these rules in clockwise order, and once all players are finished, the dealer reveals both cards. The dealer continues drawing cards until the hand value is at least 17, then stops. At this stage, players with a higher hand value than the dealer win their bets. For instance, if they bet $25, they win $25. Players with the same value as the dealer keep their bets but don't win anything, while those with a lower hand value lose their bets. There is one more scoring rule in blackjack. If a player or the dealer is dealt an ace and a face card as their initial two cards, they achieve what's known as a blackjack, considered the best possible hand in the game. This also triggers an extra bonus payout for the player, set at 3 to 2. For example, if you bet $50 and win with a blackjack, you'll receive an additional $75. Here are a few more important rules to remember. Players can double their original bet and receive one more card, known as doubling down. In this simulation, players can double down at any time during their turn, but some casinos may have different rules. If a player has two cards with the same value, they can split their hand effectively placing two separate bets, but receiving only one card each. This rule can potentially lead to more wins. There is also a move called Insurance, available when the dealer's face-up card is an ace. Players can make a side bet up to half their original bet, betting that the dealer has a blackjack. Insurance is typically not favorable for players, but it becomes crucial when counting cards. Hopefully everything is clear up to this point, if not, there is a link in the description that provides a more detailed explanation of the blackjack rules. So, what gives the dealer an edge in blackjack? The player acts first, risking going over 21, while the dealer doesn't draw any cards unless the player stays in the game. This slight advantage is how casinos make their profit. Casinos typically have about 0.5% edge against each player if players play perfectly. However, most players make mistakes, further boosting casinos' profits. This is why it's difficult to consistently win against casinos. The odds are stacked against you in the long run. But is there more to it than that? We will create the Blackjack engine for our simulation. I'll use Python for this project. First, let's define a single deck of cards. Each card will be assigned a value as discussed earlier and will include all four suits. Additionally, I'll write a function to randomly shuffle a specified number of decks. Let's also add a function to calculate the hand score. If the score is 21, 
and there are exactly two cards in the hand, we have a blackjack, which I represent as zero. While this is not a production quality approach, it will get the job done. Additionally, we need to consider aces, which can be counted as either 1 or 11. If counting an ace as 11 would cause the score to exceed 21, we count it as 1 instead. This function returns the highest valid score. Now that we've covered the fundamentals, let's build the engine. In Blackjack, there are n decks of cards stored in a device called the dealer's shoe. Cards are dealt from the shoe and is reshuffled when there are few remaining cards, usually around 60. The engine will decide when to draw cards from or reshuffle the shoe. This is a good starting point. I want to create an API where we can input a list of strategies to determine gameplay decisions. Before starting the game, we'll ensure the shoe is reshuffled if necessary. Each strategy corresponds to a player and determines their initial bet. Next, we'll deal two cards to each player and then to the dealer. And finally, we'll ask the players if they want to take insurance, assuming the dealer's face-up card is an ace. If they do, the player will place half of their original bet as insurance. The next phase of the game involves allowing each player to make decisions until they either exceed 21 or choose to stand. Since players can have multiple bets, such as after splitting their hand, I've decided to represent the bets and the player separately. The player is aware of the strategy and keeps track of all their bets, including insurance bets. The regular bet includes the bet amount, associated cards, and whether double down was used. We pay attention to double down because it ends the player's turn. My plan is to loop through all the players and their bets until their turn is finished, prompting each player for their next action. The isOver function only verifies if the player's bet is busted, was doubled down, or if the dealer or the player have a blackjack. Let's handle the actions as well. If the action is hit, the player draws the next card. If it's a double down, they draw the next card, double the bet amount, and set the double down flag. Lastly, for a split action, we create a new bet for the player. This new bet is added to the end of the player's list of bets to ensure it's processed. All right, we've covered a lot of ground with the code, but there's still more to do. Our next task is to implement the dealer's behavior, which involves drawing cards until the score reaches at least 17. However, we only proceed with this if at least one bet is still active in the game. The final step is to resolve the payouts based on the final scores and return the results. I won't go into the specifics of the calculate profit functions. Their purpose is to determine the game's winner and calculate the amount of money the player won or lost. Players receive a one-to-one -one payout for winning bets, meaning they win an amount equal to their bet. The exception is when the player wins with a blackjack, resulting in a payout of 3 to 2. Now let's implement a very basic strategy. Despite its simplicity, this strategy performs quite well, especially when we lack additional information about the cards in the deck. So, what is this strategy? The player's moves are structured based on the dealer's up card. When the dealer's up card is good, say 7 or higher, the player should draw until reaching a score of at least 17. The rationale is that the dealer is more likely to have a number between 17 and 21 by the end of the game than to go bust. Conversely, when the dealer's up card is bad, say 4, 5, or 6, the player should stop drawing when their score reaches at least 12. The goal here is to avoid drawing cards that might lead to going bust, allowing the dealer to potentially exceed 21. Finally, when the dealer's up card is neutral, either 2 or 3, the player draws until they have at least 13. Also, we never take insurance in the basic strategy. As I'm not a blackjack expert, I won't go into the detailed justification of this strategy. That's precisely why I'm creating this simulation, to test and validate it. That's it for now. I've omitted some details from the basic strategy, but we will revisit them later. Let's finalize the code to run the simulation. We'll run multiple simulations with many games. Then, we'll track the profits generated by the strategy to plot them later. All that's left is to execute the basic strategy. I'll run 10 simulations, each having 100,000 games. For context, 100,000 games is roughly 1,600 hours. That would amount to a whole year of playing blackjack for 5 hours a day. The shoe contains 6 decks and is reshuffled when the number of cards drops below 60. 
This is a common practice in modern casinos. After completing a total of 10 million games, we've incurred losses of nearly 400,000 bet sizes, which is approximately a 4% loss per game. Therefore, we can conclude that the casino edge in this scenario is 4%. This outcome is rather unfavorable because Blackjack typically offers a smaller casino edge compared to other games. This is because we didn't include all parts of the basic strategy. For instance, we didn't account for hands with an ace, known as soft hands. If a player has a soft hand, they should draw until the score is at least 18. Let's check if this change had any impact. It appears that factoring in a soft hand improves our chances by nearly 1%. While this is a decent improvement, the casino still maintains a 3% edge. What other strategies could we explore? We can double down our bet and increase our potential profit if the situation favors the player. What makes things favorable? The strategy advises doubling down when the player's score is 11. Or the player's score is 10, but only if the dealer's up card is not an ace or a 10. Or the player's score is 9, and the dealer's up card is 6 or lower. So, would this be an improvement? This addition boosts our advantage by about 1.4% indicating that knowing when to double down is a crucial aspect of gameplay. Let's also look at splitting. For splitting, the player should always split a pair of aces or eights. Additionally, they should split sixes if the dealer's up card is six or lower. In all other situations, the player follows previous rules. Let's see the graphs. Splitting improves the advantage by an extra 1%, showing that knowing when to split is also crucial. I don't think we can significantly improve upon this, so I'll conclude that with this basic strategy, casinos maintain an edge of about 0.7%. To put this into perspective, if one bet was $25, we would lose around 12.5 cents on average per game. If we played for an hour, we would lose roughly $7.5, assuming approximately one hand is played each minute. It's worth noting that in this simulation, I allow players to double down after splitting, which might not be permitted in some casinos. Additionally, the blackjack payout is 3 to 2. However, in some casinos it might be 6 to 5, further increasing the edge for them. But what about card counting? We've seen movies where mathematicians count cards and win big at blackjack. What do they do and does it work? After some research, I found that there are several card counting techniques. The most popular one is called high-low counting because it's relatively easy to learn and still yields good results. So, What's this strategy? The counting method relies on the notion that the dealer is more likely to go bust when there is a greater portion of high cards in the deck. Additionally, there are other benefits for the player when there is an imbalance between high and low cards. To utilize this method, we need to keep track of high and low cards. The high-low method suggests the following. After the shoe is shuffled, reset your count to zero. Subtract one from the count for each face card or an ace. We do nothing for the cards in between. And finally, add 1 to the count for each card with a value 6 or lower. A high count indicates more high cards in the shoe, and vice versa. The count is then divided by the number of remaining decks, scaled as if there was only one deck in the game. This gives us a true count. For example, if the running count is 10, and there are 5 decks remaining, the true count is 2. Counting is relatively easy to master, while estimating the number of remaining decks can be done by observing the shoe. Alternatively, the player can track how many cards were dealt. It's not crucial to be super precise for the strategy to be effective. Let's give this a shot. I've expanded the blackjack engine to inform the strategy whenever the shoe is reshuffled and whenever the card is dealt. This mimics the interface a human would have at a blackjack table. Upon reshuffling the shoe, we reset the counts. When a card is drawn, we update the running count and adjust the true count based on the number of remaining decks. We'll ignore any rounding issues in this process. I will adjust the initial bet for the strategy to favor the games with a higher true count. Here's how. I will bet 1 if the true count is 1 or lower, bet 2 for a true count of 2, bet 4 for a true count of 3, and so on. I won't bet more than 6. I didn't come up with these numbers myself. I read about them in the Blackjack Attack book, but it suggested that other betting strategies could be effective as well. Let's see how this performs. The strategy nearly balances the game for the player, which is quite promising. However, it's still not profitable. 
the house maintains an edge of about 0.1%. I spent a lot of time experimenting with different strategies, but even the more complex ones didn't yield much success. It became clear that choosing the right betting size is crucial. But aren't we already doing that? The issue is that our strategy ends up playing many games with a low true count. Even though it's betting less in these cases, it's much better to avoid them altogether. In a real-life scenario, this would mean leaving the table if you were the only player. Let's fix that. I still want to play even when the true count is around zero, otherwise we'd rarely get a chance to start counting in the first place. I've also raised the maximum betting size to 8. This change gives us an amazing 0.6% improvement. We're finally starting to turn profit. But the improvements don't stop there. With information about the remaining cards, we can refine our strategy to make smarter decisions. We refer to these adjustments as deviations because they deviate from the basic strategy. One widely used set of deviation rules is called the illustrious 18. These consist of 18 rules that dictate when a player should deviate from the basic strategy based on their knowledge of the high-low true count. Let's begin with the first rule. It suggests that a player should take insurance against the blackjack if the true count is at least 3. Just as a reminder, insurance is a side bet placed on the possibility that a dealer has a blackjack if their face-up card is an ace. The basic strategy never takes insurance because, without the additional information, it's not advantageous for the player at all. I've confirmed this, and you can trust me that using insurance without counting cards gives the casino an edge. It increases it from half a percent to nearly 1%. Let's take insurance if the true count is at least 3. Using insurance gives the player a 0.7% advantage. To be honest, this isn't as good as I expected, especially considering that it's the best play among the deviations. Let's incorporate the second deviation, which advises the player to stand instead of hitting if they have a score of 16 against the dealer's 10, and if the true count is at least 0. In this scenario, it's more probable for the player to go bust if they hit. Just to recall, the basic strategy suggests that the player should hit until the score is at least 17, or 18 for a soft hand. So what's the impact? This results in a marginal improvement of 0.03%. It's so small that it's likely due to random fluctuations rather than a significant enhancement. Let's add one more rule. I won't add all 18 individually, but it's believed that the top 3 rules are the most crucial. The next rule is similar. The player should stand with a score of 15 against the dealer's 10, if the true count is at least 4. This doesn't give us any improvement, and the standard deviation is around 0.6%. I was hoping for some improvement, so I spent a lot of time searching for a bug on my end. Unfortunately, I couldn't find one, so I'm choosing to trust that these numbers are accurate. Maybe this rule is beneficial in other types of blackjack. Let's add all 18 rules. I won't go into the specifics here, but you can find them online. I will also include some links in the description. Adding all these rules doesn't result in any improvements, so my conclusion is that it's only worthwhile to learn the first two rules from the illustrious 18 deviations. So, what is this telling us? Is counting cards in blackjack worth it? My analysis suggests that it's obviously worth considering, but can we actually make money with it? If played correctly, the player can earn around 0.7 on average per bet, assuming the blackjack pays 3 to 2 and the table allows doubling after splitting. With very few players at a table, we could play roughly 50 blackjack games per hour. If we play for an hour, we'd win around 0.4 bets. How does this translate to dollars? If we're betting $25 each time, that's $8.75 per hour. Some research says that we should have a bankroll of around $25,000, although I haven't looked into the reasoning behind this. This bankroll allows us to sustain losses worth 1,000 bets. If we play $100 bets, We'd need a bankroll of 100,000, but we could earn around $35 per hour. Based on these numbers, I personally wouldn't play blackjack to earn money. There are better ways, in my opinion, to earn more money with less risk. I might try card counting next time I'm at a casino, just for fun. There's another rule in blackjack called surrender, but many casinos don't allow it. It allows the player to surrender at the start of the game before seeing any more cards, but they only lose half of their bet. The basic strategy doesn't include any surrender plays, but there are four additional deviations called the Fab 4 for high-low counting that indicate when to surrender. I won't go into the specifics, but the general idea is to surrender if it seems like the player would likely lose. After adding this and comparing the outcomes, 
I saw an improvement of around 0.1%, giving the player a total edge of 0.84%. This is quite promising, although it could also be due to the variance. I've conducted multiple runs with hundreds of millions of hands, and the results typically range around 0.8%, but occasionally closer to 0.7%. That concludes today's video. I hope you found it informative and enjoyable. If you did, don't forget to show your support by hitting the like button and subscribing to my channel for more content like this. If you're a blackjack player, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this analysis. Feel free to let me know if you have any feedback or corrections. And be sure to share this video with your friends and fellow blackjack enthusiasts. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.